What's up, Accelerators? Welcome to Normalize It, the show where we speak about and explore the business of disability inclusion and accessibility. I'm your host, Cam Baudouin, and on each episode, I'll be interviewing leaders, professionals, and people with lived experiences, and we'll be discussing the challenges, successes, and strategies on how to make this world a more inclusive place. As you know, many organizations are still trying to figure out disability inclusion through a trial and error method. That's inefficient. Stick around to the end of the show to find out how we can fix that. So whether you're an advocate, entrepreneur, business owner, stakeholder, VP, or just someone who's interested in the world of disability inclusion, this show is for you. Let's dive into it. I want to talk really about, you know, content creation and comedy and stuff like that. But I want to hear from you when you talk to people, what are people so afraid of when they really get into creating videos online, especially in this LinkedIn sphere, which people tend to think of as like, it's an online resume. What, what do you say to something like that? The stakes are not as high as they seem. People are afraid they're going to go look stupid and it's going to reflect poorly on them. And then they're going to suffer some sort of consequence for that. You know, maybe they're going to do something and they're not serious enough and it's going to cost them a job. People tell themselves that it's not the right time or they need a better script or they need a better camera or they need a green screen or they need this or they need that. Ooh, that was me, everyone. That was me for sure. <laughs> That's everyone, you know, and um, really the people who are doing it most successfully are the people who can just take out their phone and do it like it's nothing. Oh, well, like just, just the phone. That's what you're saying that people should be doing. Should I well, I mean, that's a good way to start. A little bit of wizardry with the editing goes a long way. Mm. Especially if you're on TikTok. TikTok is designed, they're designed, they have a lot of editing features there native in the app. People do all the time where it's just them standing at this angle and they stop right, the right. camera and they throw on a jacket and then it's them standing at this angle. People go viral doing that. People make careers off that. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that they're out there doing something is what's important. That you do anything at all is more important than what you do. In your coaching and stuff like that, you talk about just be funny, but not just be funny. But what do you say to people who are who are thinking that? Who think like, I can't do that because I'm not creative or I'm not funny or stuff like that. You know, you have to realize it's not about your accomplishments. It's what you know, and it's your personality. You are a character on screen. If you are like doing a, a show that's entertaining, or if you're giving a business speech, if someone's watching you on a screen, we're all sharing the same space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like realizing that like you do have value, you do know something, go on camera, talk about what you know. If you just come out there as yourself, that's actually what's funny. I'm a trained improviser and they beat it into your head that you are not going for the joke. You're going for mm. the honesty. And when the audience sees a person in their element just acting naturally, it's fascinating because we, we never actually get to see that. If you just show up in your element talking about what you're passionate about, it's fascinating. That's really cool because I know right now everything's about authenticity, right? Everyone talks about being authentic on camera, being authentic in front of this. And I know with my, let's call them my, my tribe, the other accessibility professionals, I consult a lot like within uh, dis the disability community, like accessibility is not funny, right? We're, we're not supposed to make it funny. But what I found a lot of success with is making it informative and making it, making it real, making it parent and talk about it and stuff like that. What could maybe, what could maybe that tribe do to, uh, uh, to raise interest or, or even just awareness around, around accessibility? diversity, inclusion, things like that. I always love talking about accessibility. The best way to learn is talk to people who have to live this way. I had a guest on my podcast yesterday. It was Lydia Allen. She is this uh, TikToker and she's a woman who, you know, she's not a comedian. She's not a trained professional on camera, but she's dyslexic. And she yeah. runs an organization yeah. where she works with dyslexic children. She works with dyslexic families. She works with educators. And she got on TikTok and she just started talking to the camera about dyslexia. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, millions of people are listening to her. Wow. Yeah. Cool. She's talking straight at you about what it's like and how frustrating it can yeah. be to operate in this world. It humanizes it, you know, and I, I tell businesses when I'm trying to tell them that accessibility is important, you know, don't think of it as like a favor you're doing. Think of it as these are human beings who want to hear what you have to right. say. Absolutely, they would yeah. love to go on your website and do the thing you're trying to get people to understand. You're leaving them out. Or, you know, the flip side of that, I'll do a bit where I'm talking to lip readers and all of a sudden the captions disappear and I'm yeah, talking like yeah. that. And all the lip readers were like, thank you for putting a joke for us in there. Yeah. And it's like, oh, if you take the time to actually just like 
you talk to your audience, the people who want to right, sit there right, in the right. audience. Yeah, it's fun. And you'll learn new things. It's just a better way to do business. I hear what you're saying when you said like you made a joke for that community or for that group that was kind of exclusive to them as well. So that was really cool. What do you say to the people who are like, yeah, but I'm not Chris Bogue. Well, everyone is funny. This is something I argue with people about. Yeah. But I come from a school of comedy that says it does not matter who you are. As long as you are doing something, you are funny. Your mom might not be a comedian, but if you get a clip of you saying something stupid and she looks at you and gives you the side eye, that's funny. Yeah. It's because it's real. You know, to the people who think that they can't do it, I say, one, a year ago, I wasn't doing it. It looks like I'm this impressive person because I'm doing comedy up here. There are hundreds of thousands of people in this country who took improv classes or who took a sketch writing class at the Second City. They're not doing this. Yeah. And before I started doing this, I was totally unremarkable. You wouldn't even notice me. I had no presence on LinkedIn. Then one day I just got on camera. I was in sales, you know, and I was yeah. not the boss. I quit my job to start my own business and I decided I'm going to be the manager of myself. I'm just going to go on camera and talk as if I'm the manager of the team. The more I got out there and talked about my vision, the more real it became. Mm. All of a sudden I started productizing myself and all of a sudden people started copying me. That just proves that it's working. But it's like, I was not invited to do this. Mm -hmm. I had to invite myself. Nobody thinks it's going to work until it starts working. I had a lot of mentors and advice from like YouTubers and content creators. When I started down this road, they get big money. They've traveled all around the world. They get, you know, they're doing quite well for themselves doing the influencer thing. I asked them, how do you build a giant audience? And they go, go one by one. Yeah, and that's one a big one. one. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and um, you find your people. And it's like, yeah, you know what? I didn't have this luxury when I was in comedy clubs. I get to pick who's in the audience. Right, right. We tend to forget that everyone who has done anything like this, like put themselves out there, started with zero followers at one point. We're seeing the results of all of their blood, sweat, and tears sometimes putting themselves out there, exposing yourself, or, or being vulnerable on camera. I don't know if you've ever had negative comments. Maybe we'll talk about that in a second there. But has anyone mm -hmm. ever, like bashed you online and you got to expose yourself to that and that can be quite targeted that can that can hit like oh that that stings but it's one person's opinion uh now i'm not only speaking about it, like in the world of, of accessibility and disability but putting yourself out there is, is a huge part of it i'm gonna hit the what do you do with the haters yeah what do you do um, with the haters then? that's what a lot of people are afraid of i can come out here and i can speak because i've failed a lot and when you see somebody, like someone who doesn't have a thumb, will do a joke where they give you a thumbs up and there's no thumb. Why Why can they do that with a smile on their face? Because they've probably been picked on for it and they've probably yeah. been made to feel terrible about it. At some point, they learn to own it. And at some point, it, you learned if you can find fun, if you can find strength in your own flaws, then people can't use those as a weapon against you. Mm, yep. And when you do comedy... You fail at it a lot. <laughs> you audition for shows and you don't make it. You know, I did sales for 10 years and I got eviscerated on the phone. I missed quotas. I got fired. I suffered through all these things where I thought, oh man, if I ever fail at that, I'm, I must have missed out as a person. And then you bomb a million times, you get your heart broken, you know, you come on hard times and then you bounce back and you realize like, oh, actually that's not as terrible as I thought it was. Yeah. And if someone online says something mean about me, they might just be going through a terrible time too. Yeah. I can't let that change the way I view about myself. And most importantly, when you're running your own business, you can't let it destroy your productivity for a day. Totally, yeah. You just learn it's not the end all be all. Let's switch gears here a little bit. I want to hear more about, about the Crispo. Why, why are you here, Chris? Like, what's the Crispo experience? Well, I am a coach. So yeah. I do implore people if anybody either runs a sales team or a marketing team, or if you're a solopreneur and you need a content strategy or a sales strategy or both, that's what I teach people to do. And right. I'm trying to do it in a different way than has been done before. I feel like sales processes were always dominated by really aggressive alpha types. I approach everything with entertainment. You know, if you follow the trends in the business world right now, email and sales does not perform as well as it used to. It's very hard to get people on the phones. But they love content. You, know, you got to invest in the content. So I'm telling people, it's like you can do this in a way that's more fun and more open and more vulnerable and more entertaining. But yeah, that involves getting on camera and being potentially unfunny self. 
Mm, yeah, um, yeah. You know, when I started doing this too, because again, I'm doing sketch comedy now in LinkedIn, but I wasn't really when I started on this road and people were just reaching out all the time. Like, okay, well, when are you doing another sketch show? At first, I didn't want to put funny stuff out there because I had that same fear of like, what if it's not good enough? If I go and tell everyone I'm the improv guy, I'm the sketch guy, they can think whatever they want. But if they watch it and I'm not actually funny, I'm going to look stupid. And then I started doing it again. I'm like, oh, of course I'm still funny. Of course. But people got to understand, you know, I quit my last job a year ago to start my own business. I was on a three-year creative dry spell prior okay. to that. So I well, thought maybe yeah. I wasn't ever going to do comedy again. Mm. Um, those shows were hard to put up. You have to write them. You have to cast them. You have to hire musicians you have to get a practice space you have to rent the stage you have to sell tickets you have to i mean they are a big ordeal yeah i was just like i don't think i got it in me anymore yeah, yeah. you know and then you get on camera and you know you'll start discovering talents you didn't even realize you had yeah you know, one thing that you said at the very beginning of the show where you talked about how, you know, I'm going to look like a fool. LinkedIn is a professional environment and stuff like that. I just want to remind everyone that in two weeks, your stuff isn't even promoted anymore on LinkedIn on the feed or stuff like that. So if your boss doesn't log into LinkedIn, <laughs> you know, at least once every two weeks, they're never going to see it. That, that's one big thing. Cause I know that was my big fear. Cause it's like, oh, I've got coworkers or I've got a boss here on LinkedIn and I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to say something that they're not in line with and, and they're not going to like it or, or something like that. I don't know. It's, it's something you, you just gotta, you gotta kind of do it. Now I, I encourage a lot more people. I'm having a lot more conversations since this is my little passion project now, LinkedIn lives or, or putting up stuff, fun content around accessibility. I encourage people like just, just, just get out there and, and, and try doing it uh, because it's, it's, you know, it's fun. It can, it can be fun. It can definitely be fun. Someone wrote humor. How do you guys gauge the temperament, knowledge, and interest of people online? There we go. Who are not in the room. I have a little bit more experience than the average person because I've done a lot of stuff on stage. A lot of the comedy bits I'm doing are rehashed versions of similar things I've done in the real world. When it comes to the temperament, knowledge, and interest of people online, there is this mistaken notion that people who have privilege and money and power don't like to laugh. The, I'll talk to people all the time. We'll see what I'm doing. And they'll be like, okay, well, that's great for you. I got to sell to C-level executives here. Right. I got to get meetings with people who are VPs of sales, CEO, CFO, CTO. And I'm like, that's who I sell to too. <laughs> you know, you don't just stop being a person once you've reached a certain level of success. Totally. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Business communication assumes that's the case. So it's like, oh, okay, this is a quote unquote serious person. Person. I got to talk to them about serious. Okay, well, I'm going to increase your ROI by 400%. And you just, you sound like everybody else. Right. Um, so I say you make the content that's real because that's what I'm doing is like the, tr the truth is funny. If you get out there and tell the truth, how can that go wrong? You have fun with it and then you pay close attention to who it lands with. And if you notice that there's certain C-level executives who are enjoying it, mm -hmm. Stay close to them. When they make content, when their company releases content, interact with it, enjoy it. But you don't know what the audience wants until you start doing stuff and they start clapping. <laughs> and the audience doesn't always know what it wants. Right, right. And performers don't always know what the audience wants. You know, if you go to an improv show and you go, okay, we need a suggestion, the audience is going to go, gay sex. They think, that guy thinks he wants to watch two performers pretend to have sex. That's not actually what's funny. Right, you right. Know, the more you do it, the more you will learn, oh, whenever I do this, people laugh. But you won't find that unless you're willing to go out there as yourself. And you got to stop thinking about like, what could I say that a million people would click the like button to. Right, yeah. And started thinking about what if I went back in time and there was a younger version of myself who didn't know what I know today, what would I tell them? Mm -hmm. how, how could I give them knowledge in a way that they would actually receive it? Because when I was 21, I wasn't taking that advice. So um, what would I say to myself? How would I shake myself out of complacency? You're talking about something that I talk about a lot in my presentations. I talk about cognitive bias or otherwise known as the curse of knowledge a lot because we forget when we become more experienced, you know, 
or we don't sit and think about, well, what does someone who's just coming in to this experience, this world, this knowledge, like, what do they know? They don't know anything, right? They, they don't know what it's all about. I, I want to maybe give my angle on this, on this question as well. How do I gauge temperament? I know my tribe really well, and I know exactly who is, who is following me. And I know exactly who's connecting with me on LinkedIn. And uh, I know it's usually technical people. And you can actually go to any of your posts and find this out yourself. If you're posting online in any capacity, if you've got more than 10 likes, that's, that's the minimum I do to start collecting data. I'll click on the post, go see the analytics, and it'll actually tell you what company that people uh, are, are interacting with, where they're from, where they're located, and what their job title is. And I found that 99% of all the content I'm doing, it's usually very technical. So usually software developers, software engineers, usually uh, user experience folks. So UX, UI, um, those types of creators as well. And then for some reason, I have founders who, who follow me a lot as well. I'm thinking that's probably because there's a lot of consultants out there or uh, you know, DEI consultants or just people in that kind of space who are self-employed and they identify as founders. That is my audience. Technical people love technical solutions. They want the if this, then that solution. So I give it to them. If you see this, just do this and you'll get this solution. And that lands really, really well with my stuff. So interest was only found after I started to just post a bunch of stuff around, you know, what do I, what do I know that a software developer likes? But what's interesting is now over time, things are changing. I get a lot of instructional designers following me now, which is something I've never, I don't even know what an instructional designer does in a daily do. basis. You do? Okay, Chris, let me know. What does an instructional designer do? I mean, depends on what school you're at. They don't really have a, the power that a professor has. So they're there to make recommendations um, but ultimately, like if the professors want to just ignore them, they can. So there's a lot of disconnect between the professors and the instructional designers. I will say what you're talking about, you know, in sales, ICP, intended customer profile or ideal customer profile, whatever that stands for, um, that's been around for a long time. And I, I think of it as sub audiences, that same okay. influencer who told me go one by one. When I coach, I instruct my clients to think of their prospects and customers as actual several different mini audiences. Mm. So for example, I've got sales folks, a lot of them like corporate bro, a lot of them, you know, they've had to live the hustle culture. So it's like salespeople are a sub audience. I also have a sub audience that hates sales and they are not <laughs> alpha types. They are not bros. Um, they specifically come to me because they want to do it a different way. And so I talk more about, you know, authenticity. I talk about creative writing. I talk about mental health. I've got people who are just pure comedy fan. They love the craft of comedy. They write comedy. They took improv classes themselves. They're just interested in the sketches and the funny stuff. I have accessibility. People who, you know, they're interested in the way I do captions. They're interested in the way I'm talking about accessibility. So I try to give all my audiences different things every week. So it's mm -hmm. like yesterday I did a podcast with an accessibility advocate. It was also about TikTok. Today, I'm going to release a Vagman sketch that's barely about business. <laughs> Pretty ridiculous, but it's Friday and my audience probably wants something light that they can just laugh at. You know, next week, I'm going to have a guest on my show whose specialty is sales. I got like 10 different micro audiences now and they want different things, but there's overlap between them. Mm -hmm. So now it's not like, oh, well, what if I say the wrong thing and it turns somebody off? I go, you know what? I'm going to put this out there because I've got these three different audience buckets and I think there's something in there for all of them to enjoy. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's TikTok and it's comedy and it's about accessibility. Um, I can target it to these different groups of people. That's the nice thing about always putting content out there. And as my network is growing, as my followers are growing, I don't have to be playing to every single audience at all times. Yeah. But sometimes those audiences will surprise me. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes I'll be putting sales content out there and I have somebody who I did not think of as a salesperson, um, but they reveal to me, they go, hey, actually, you know what? I've been saving up money. I've been working. I'm quitting my job and I'm starting my own business. And I'm interested in, in you know, maybe bringing you on to help me get my sales process off the ground. People will surprise you. Again, the, as the performer, you don't know what your audience is going to do until you actually put something out there. Mm -hmm. And once you put something out there, it's no longer fully yours. That's going to dictate where you're going. In the social media world, it is a two-way street. You're affecting your audience and your audience is affecting you. Brendan's asking, what kind of exercises do you employ when developing your character? Okay, so a couple thoughts. One, you start with yourself. I was always taught, wear your character as a thin veil. 
if you watch my videos, most of my characters are just me leaning into a different emotion. So it's like, I'm playing the boss, you know, I'm changing my voice a little bit, but it's still me. It is a less patient version of me. It is a more unreasonable version of me, but it's me. I've got this character, Snurg, who's my best friend that doesn't answer any of my calls. It's a more annoyed version of me. It's still just me, but I'm, I'm putting on a different energy. And if you hold on to that energy, especially in a forum like TikTok, you know, all you need to do is have that energy for five seconds and you're a mm. different person. Back when I was in improv, we did an exercise called La Ronde. It was a very simple premise. It's, it's two per people. So there's person A and person B. And you go out there and you start a two-person scene. And at some point, person C comes in, they tag out person A. Person B stays the same character, but now they're in a scene with person C. And person C's goal is to reverse the power dynamic. So let's say oh. you know, person A and B, it's me and Cam there, um, and I'm the boss, and I'm chewing Cam out. Maybe somebody's going to tag Cam out, and now it's the next scene, and they're my wife. Yeah, and yeah. We're at home, and she's the boss. And now we get to see what my character does when they don't have the power. Mm. By putting that character in two different circumstances, one where they have control and one where they don't have control, you get a much more fleshed out, much more realized person. That's exactly what I do, even with my developer character and, and the manager character. Sometimes the manager is this guy, this goofy guy who just thinks, oh, you know, accessibility will just figure itself out. I don't need to plan for that. But then other times he's even doing things like, no, we got to schedule this. We got to do it this way because this is how, where this is where the money comes from or stuff like that. And then the developer character, he's the one like, exasperated sometimes like like I've been like I've been in my job and my day to day when I was a junior developer when I didn't know how to react to that scenario but then even later on in my career when I became a more senior developer I I kind of play both uh sides of the coin let's call it right yeah and you know Chicago's school of comedy is all about like what is the relationship between these people to one another or if, if you're just one person like i am in a lot of my sketches what is my relationship to the audience here again it's that you are doing something with intention is what's important you know to to the question about the character i say start with your dad or your mom sometimes <laughs> um, when you think of it that way if you go into a scene and you're like okay this character is basically my dad now when something happens i don't have to think like oh what's the funniest thing i could say Right. I think, what would my dad say in this situation? Right, right. I guess it, it, that's like a lot easier to think of as well, right? Because you kind of give yourself, you already, you're already really comfortable with that person, be it a coworker or a boss or your dad or something like that. And you, you don't have to guess, right? You're not guessing, you're not creating something new. And I think that's, that's a whole part of being creative, right? You know, you, you can just layer on top of someone else and just still create great stuff. Yeah, and and, you don't and the to. more you lean into it, the more you yeah. just try to like, I am not going to be a comedian up here. I'm going to talk about Star Wars the exact way my dad would talk about Star Wars. The more faithfully you can do that, the funnier it is. Yeah. And yeah. if you're doing mime work on stage, I was always taught like, you want to have three points of reference on the stage. Because if you're on an improv scene, the audience has nothing. You are one person up there. There is nothing real. So you have to start interacting with the space as though it's a real place. So I always say, if you're in an improv scene, we need a location. And they're like, kitchen. Imagine your kitchen. Right. You pick three things. And you think, okay, well, I know my garbage can is here. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to push, put my foot down. And I'm going to pretend like the lid pops up. And I'm going to throw away a piece of garbage. And the fridge is over here against the wall. And there's the kitchen door. Right. The fact that you can move to those three places with ease and just like open the fridge and look in there and all of a sudden it feels real to the audience. Right, and right, right. You start developing a character because you you have attitudes about your own kitchen. You know exactly where the knives are. You know how to grab a cutting board and you know how to grab like a, a plastic bag. And all of a sudden you're moving around the space as a real person. And again, it's a just a slightly different version of you, but it's still just you. I think we can get to one more question just because we got five minutes left. Let's talk about self-deprecating humor because someone here said, I test high for self-deprecation uh, type humor. When is it a mistake to show that you can laugh at your own failures, mistakes, or things like that? It depends on the audience. Okay. Sometimes I self-deprecate to bring myself down to the audience's level and show them that I don't think I'm better than them. But most people are too self-deprecating. Hmm. I feel part of the reason why my bits work is because I have the confidence to know that it's a good bit. So I, I'd say that the time, definitely the time not to be self-deprecating 
is right before you introduce a piece of content to a room. Okay. Whether that's on LinkedIn, whether you're in a sketch group and you got to bring your sketch there. Um, the biggest mistake I'll see people make is they're, they got to go read their sketch to the room. They go, okay, I don't know you guys. I was trying to figure out this thing, the ending. I was trying to satirize Game of Thrones, but it didn't, I don't even know here. Let's just let me know. It, and it's like, they start explaining the flaws before they read the script. Yeah. And what you're doing in that situation is you are instructing your audience to look for flaws instead of to enjoy the piece as a whole. Ah, and if you post a piece good. of content out there saying, hey, you know, I made this video. I don't know. The lights were kind of off and I'm really kind of awkward and this and that and that. That's what your audience is going to focus on. So I would say um, it's a good it's a good icebreaker. If you're in front of people, it's a good way to humanize yourself. But if you've got an idea for a message, don't self-deprecate it. You know, just put it out there. If the audience doesn't like it, they're going to just scroll on, but don't give them reasons not to like it before they've even given it a chance. I love that. That's that's like such great advice. I don't have anything to add to that either. That's, that's been great. Maybe we'll leave it there. I think this is great. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show today. We really appreciate it. Hope everyone who's listening got some uh, great information on that, on how to create content, how to be funny, how to grow their own influence and stuff like that. What, I forgot to plug my website. So. Yeah, yeah. Where where do you want, where can we find you? How can we, uh, how can we find you? Yeah, if anybody wants to check me out, go to ChristopherBogue.com. You can follow me on TikTok at Chris Sells His Soul, or you can go on LinkedIn and ring my bell to get notifications from me every day because I create lots of content there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. Wasn't that a great episode? You probably have lots of new ideas swirling through your head right now. Now, how are you going to go and teach that to your boss, your team, or your clients? You need a strategy to move forward. Contact me today, hi at cambodwayne.com, and let's talk about how we can move this forward in your organization or individual practice. If you could right now, like and subscribe to this show, it really does help grow our reach to get more people involved and interested in disability inclusion and making the world a more inclusive place. And don't forget, you can also watch this show live on LinkedIn. Just find me there. It's every Friday at noon Eastern. See you next week.